today all our will be devoted to the early phase of this most famous artist's career. And um, the next series, which begins in um, mid-May and is on Thursday afternoons at three, we'll pick up with this and then do all the impressionists and see where we go beyond that. So here's a, a portrait of Monet as a young man. Actually, this would be, it's painted by Renoir and it's from the year after that first Impressionist show. When Monet was still struggling, but with the help of Durand Ruel's business acumen, and his enthusiasm for Monet, uh, that's going to change ultimately. In the first years of Monet's career, he was desperately poor. Um, so just a little about his, his youth. Um, he was actually born in Paris, but his parents moved to Le Havre when he was really young. His father had a grocery business and um, supplied chips. And his mother was a singer. Uh, his mother was much more um, favorably inclined toward her son's interest in art than his uh, practically minded father was. But she died when he was 16. Uh, so he didn't, fortunately he had a, a widowed, fairly wealthy aunt who also was willing to encourage him because he had an innate talent, a prodigious talent that was evident when he was really very young. <clears throat> so he worked, um, we'll see some of the very first works he does. He, he worked in the Havre, then finally got permission from his father to go to Paris to study, uh, studied in the studio of an artist where he met Renoir and Cicely and, and Basile, the, a part of the core group of the later known Impressionists. And um, still, while well, he was exploring what he was doing, this new way of working out of doors. So he went from truly impoverished, I mean, desperately impoverished, supported by his friends. He had one patron who helped, <clears throat> very poor, to at the end of his life, an owner of a grand self-created estate, a man wealthy enough to donate his late works to the country of France. So it's a, quite a trajectory. There's Duran Durell. In his early work, you see Le Havre, well, a lot of you know from this and traveling, it's really at the mouth of the Seine. So he grows up here and he will then spend a lot of time over here. And we'll look at paintings done here and here. All in an area where his lifelong predilection has uh, develops, which is to study skies and seas and water and reflections of skies on water. He's always drawn to that. And <clears throat> this English Channel, there's a lot of changeable weather. So we had a lot of interesting skies to look at. But this is what he did. When he was a youngster in school, a oh, rotten student, couldn't, could care less about school. But he, he just drew absolutely wickedly wonderful caricatures. Um, this, I believe, was one of, one of his teachers. So he's about 15, 16 when he's doing these. And to make a little pocket money, he had these um, posted in a local shop for people to buy them.
And there in, in Le Havre, he met um, an artist somewhat older than him, about 15, 16 years older than him, who um, took him under his wing and sort of introduced him to oil painting and most particularly to painting out of doors. That's this artist, Eugene Boudin, shown later in his life. They were, he um, died, I think, well, toward the end of the century. And, and he and Monet were just lifelong friends. So um, Boudin, B-O-U-D-I-N, here you have his name. First showed in the salon in 1850. And then quite apart from that kind of like the luster of a public career, um, he, he, he was just uh, turning out relatively small paintings that sold by the hundreds. The Washington National Gallery has a great collection of them because one of the great benefactors <clears throat> of the museum collected them. And this is the kind of work that Boudin did. So he painted out of doors. These scenes there may be maximally two feet by two and a half feet. And they're showing the phenomenon of absolutely contemporary life in France at this time, when there's a growing middle class and this is growing middle class leisure. Parisians uh, could um, take a train and very easily get up here to the coast or they would stay at hotels along the coast and enjoy their vacations. <clears throat> and so Boudin did just numerous paintings like this of all very fashionably dressed people. Uh, these are bathing cabins here. And he, not, he never really, as you can see, concentrates on the person as an individual. It's the activity of being a tourist that's new. That's part of this realist showing the world as it is now. And Boudin's real interest is most evident in the skies. Corot, in fact, calls him the Michelangelo of skies, I think it is. That Monet's subsequent interest in atmosphere, in weather conditions, in skies, in water, must have had its well, encouragement, if not of its genesis with um, Boudin's work. So you see, he indicates through these flags up here on these high poles that the, how strongly the wind is blowing or here, this lady's dress blowing forward. Look at that veil. You can just feel that chill, constant breeze. Or here's another one. almost as if the people had huddled to get out of the wind. How the one steamship, how low the steam runs across there. Seems to have blown over a wicker chair. So they are statements of what life was like. These are from, well, this can be even as anywhere in the third quarter of the 19th century. And sometimes just it's the condition of being along the water. This is another harbor that he did. His father had wanted, his father had one time been a sailor and he wanted Boudin to be a sailor. But instead, Boudin set up his painting apparatus and painted what was out on the water. Well, and I'll show you one more by him. And I show this because Monet had made sure that he was invited to join the first Impressionist exhibition in 1874. And this is the painting that, that was included in the show by him.
this rattles me, this particular painting. It's, it's, it's so extremely difficult for me to, um, oh my goodness, let's get rid of this. This is by Monet. And this is by Monet at age 17, 18. And this is, as, as far as is known, about the first oil painting that Monet had completed under the guidance of um, Boudin, who took him on a sort of a painting trip to um, an area just near um, Le Havre. And this, uh, let me give you the idea of the size of this. It's a foot and a half by two feet. And this was shown in Le Havre in the annual municipal exhibition. And I'm gonna spend some time with this. Not because it's a typical Monet or, uh, it's just uh, astonishing. It is not at all typical of Monet in that it follows the conventions of landscape painting. Even though he and Boudin are working outdoors and sketching outdoors for this, this is something that Monet did in the studio. And in the studio would mean uh, possibly rearranging it emphasizing altering details to make a complete and correct and finished painting. Now, what in this makes it a, well, it's not absolutely correct, but a, a complete and finished painting, you can still see in this painting, not just the breeze blowing and people huddled. Um, notice how he had, Boudin had put the people over to the side of the picture. So you had the sense of them huddled against that strong breeze. Very, um, it's, it's very telling what he does. But um, that here it's like Monet's mind, his planning is in control. And while you look for that, well, all sorts of things. Um, so I'm doing this in more detail than I will with any of the others because this is a, then a, a kind of a standard against which you can look at, at Monet's other what we think of as typical Monet works. First of all, you have something to lead you into the landscape. That's paramount. And that goes back to the 16th and 17th century. This is especially in French landscapes. This is, you had to have a path or something so that the viewer can have a sense of entering into the scene. So here you have this water, wonderfully reflective water. And it takes you back to a fisherman who's in this bright blue. So although he's small, as he ought to be in a, in a larger landscape, your eye is drawn to him by the color. And then you have a lush field. Now, it's not enough cloud in the sky so that you could uh, sort of see the panorama where the land is dark, where it's the clouds shield it from the sun, and then there's a strip that's light and then dark and light. That's one way of suggesting things going back in depth. But here it is, this must be wheat or some ripened grain, a little bit shows through here. So you have a kind of a layering going back. And of course the trees get smaller and smaller. So you have a sense of, although you can't see it over this crest of hills, there's some very distant landscape continuing over there. So it gives you several ways to know that this is not flat. No, you can imagine yourself into the land. And you have this close up, more carefully done clump of bushes here. And then they lose their detail as they go back. And that's true to optical observing. Well, where's the arrangement? Those are, okay, that follows the rules, but where's the arrangement? Look how this tall poplar merges with the clouds. And that part of the cloud has very much the silhouette of this. 
And this cloud acts like a bracket, uh, an umbrella over this row of poppers. And the shape of that curve and the shape of this curve is carried on by the trees over here. Or this line comes right down into here. So you could plot the composition on a flat surface and see the, the shapes and the lines, how they are meant to integrate um, <clears throat> with one another. So that's the human mind making itself apparent by how it has organized landscape. And just a closer detail. Now, where, where did this fall? Not quite true to life. At least as far as I could tell, I was looking at the shadows. So where's the sun? Well, of course not visible, but here you have shadows slanting this way as if the sun is off to the top right somewhere out of view. And that would fit over here too. The change of the angle could be because this is flat land and that's a hilly slope. But what's this one? And why is so much of the bank and the plants at the edge hello? in shade? Yes, hello. hello? Yeah. Is this, breast, is this the breast center? No, no, you, you have um, a mill lecture. Okay. Oh, God. Way to go. So there, the virtue of the art has superseded the virtue of the mind. These are poplar trees, and poplar trees are all over that area. And we'll take you right, because I, since we're not going to get to the end of Monet's career by any chance today, I think we'll do well if we get to 1874. I'll uh, show you. Excuse me. Uh, someone needs to mute. The person who asked about the branch center, you need to get out of... Um, the your connection to the mill class so this is from the late 1880s this is a painting this one i think is in the met of poplars and here's one he did in beginning of the 1890s and this one is in philadelphia that's when he does ultimately series paintings and he comes back again and again um, as this favorite theme to, to these, these wonderfully tall, spindly, and regular trees. So it's like, oh, it's, it's true to that area, but it's also true to what he likes. This is not, <laughs> I don't think I need to tell you, this is not by Monet. <clears throat> he did then get permission from his father to go to um, Paris, which was so easy to get there, um, but to go to Paris and study art finally. And he worked with um, an artist associated with the Academy. Um, I'm not even going to give you his name because he's going to be not particularly meaningful. But it was a, a, a Swiss-born artist who, who's uh, probably most famous for um, statements about how you can never be detailed enough. Just the incredible exactitude of this historical scene he did for, was commissioned for a place in, in a, a historical event in, in Switzerland. But who also did this. There are many, many copies. Oh, this was hugely popular in the Victorian era. And this is just called Lost Illusions. This man who's staying nameless had, had traveled in the Near East in the 1830s and accompanying someone. Uh, 
And while there he had this dream, and this dream was of a, a poet um, just seeing all his illusions sort of floating in a bark, this boat just floating away down the Nile. And so this is tremendously, although ex extremely full of exact details, extremely romantic work. Wow, what is Monet doing in the shop of some a studio of someone who works like this? It's not to, to learn how to do something else, but because this artist had a very um, uh, unusual setup, which was that you didn't need to pay fees for his instruction. You paid to help pay for the rent of the space and paid also to help pay for the models. That was also true at the Academy Suisse where, where everybody contributed operating artists, students as well, because there would be live models there every day so they could work from the model. So Monet went there because he could get instruction of some kind, learning more about the basics of using materials basically. And he's not the only one. He enormously benefited from this because that's where he met Renoir, there for the same reason, and Cicely, there for the same reason, and Basile, who didn't need the money, the discount of having a teacher like this, but happened to be working there for this, to be working with someone who had a rather more laissez-faire attitude. So those young men, um, as a group, left that artist's studio and decided just to, to um, they're hearing the, the siren song of, of modernity. Let's work showing today's world in a way that's appropriate for today. And so now, for a while, we're just looking only at Monet's. And this is a very early one. This is 1858. And it's a view from a street, a little area in Le Havre, kind of a old part of town. And this one is in the, um, let's see, I think this one is in, um, no, I better not say. I think it's the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, but I'm not absolutely certain. Now this does not look very radical, but you can see it's certainly painted differently than when he had done that landscape when he was working with Boudin, because you do begin to see the very loose brushstroke where he's, he's got, he uses a wide brush and then he's just scrubbing the paint across in patches. And also the color is, for its time, unusually bright. I mean, there's just plain yellow, plain blue, brown in a solid patch. There's not much subtle shading of color to color. So it's much more forceful and it's more clearly made by someone. And this is a cart on a snowy road. This is 1865. Altogether, in Monet's life, he did about 140 snow scenes. He obviously enjoyed this very much. Uh, this is about, you know, this is one of those about two feet by three feet um, in the Musée d'Orsay, where the, there's a vast collection of Monet's. So you see that, well, that's very evident. One of the pleasures of doing a snow scene is that you have to work with this kind of leaden sky, how you're going to differentiate all these different whites or the dusted with white on the trees, the coated on there, dirty with the cart ruts all very different from the mm, sort of sandy colored, sun infused behind the clouds sky. 
this actually he did in his studio. But it's, um, and it's kind of conservative. It still has that kind of forceful, deliberately kind of crude technique. But this is timeless peasant life still in this one. Um, there were many artists doing snowy scenes right around this time in the middle of the 19th century. I want to, one of the artists who was making it especially an inviting subject by inviting in the sense that it bringing recognition to it was, you see, this is a Courbet. There were in uh, those years just um, evidently just um, a series of years of heavy snows in, in France. So a number of artists are drawn to it. But now look at the way Courbet does snow. Uh, this is one of the uh, clearest ones I could find for it. When he shows snow, let's look at it up here. It is literally as if white paint is built up on the surface. So that's stuff on top of the tree. So that's his concept of realism. He is giving that that tactile technical tactile quality as if this is piled on top of everything painted beneath it as true snow would be which is not monet's interest these are color differences no, textural. We wouldn't otherwise get to this one today, but <clears throat> to show you an, uh, one, he, another one he did, a far more famous one. This is just three years later. I mean, Monet uh, worked very rapidly uh, and uh, constantly undeveloped. I mean, he's just meteoric in the rate of change in what he's doing. This one is called the magpie, or it's resident right here. And uh, this was rejected by the salon, too crude. It's in the uh, Musée d'Orsay, and it's their absolutely most favorite work of art today. This was too crude, too garish for the judges and for most of the public. And for us, one of the things that's significant other than that, I just think it's quite lovely because we like bright color. Uh, we like to see the artist at work. We are um, enchanted by what Monet does. This is the first one where he's beginning or manifesting that interest in how do colors change in light? It's not just even the texture of how snow blankets things and how that creates different skies and utterly transforms the trees. But this is the first one where he uses blue for shadows rather than the conventional gray. Of course, this would be dirty, but still, it was the convention, always just to show gray. Monet, who one person said, oh, he's only an eye, but oh, what an eye, had um, extraordinary sensitivity to colors. And he, when you go out, when there's next year, when we have a good snow, you'll need to remember and look at this too. You can see when the sun is bright or it's bright overhead, and the cast shadows, there is, just as there's gold in the white here, there's blue. Monet, when he's doing these paintings, and we'll just leave this lovely one on while I talk about this, uh, insisted it needs to be painted right in front of what you're looking at. It's not to be done in the studio. He is responding absolutely to what he sees in front of him. And as what he sees in front of him changes, 
uh, he's actually going to have to change painting. And that is one uh, sort of a enhancement to the desire to show things, work in a kind of a sketchy way because you have to work with some rapidity. But he wants to show that he's working with rapidity and with impulse such that you have that kind of like a, a biographical element of, of the artist present in a painting like this. And also there's a degree of uh, artifice. It is certainly true that Monet painted plenty of times out in the cold and the snow with those portable easels that were then available. Uh, but it would be highly unlikely that a magpie would sit there long enough for the several hours it would take him to do a painting. Nor would the shadows in just the space of two hours be staying so precisely in these areas. So they're often looking more spontaneous than they actually are. Look at the little bits of a creature has walked through the snow here. Or is that where little bits of light are coming through the walls? Monet once said, he's not interested in the objects. He's not interested in the magpie, the fence, the trees, the building. He's interested in what's between him and them. He's interested in the light and the atmosphere. How's that for something to paint? That's a challenge no one would have taken up. You painted light on objects. But your desire wasn't to show this, except for Boudin. This is the breeze. This is the temperature. This is what the sunlight is like right now. This is what things look like in that sunlight right now. So this is the great, one of the great changes in, in Monet's um, ambitions for what a painting can do. So as they say, the salon ugh, couldn't take this, just absolutely couldn't take this. It would be considered an impression, but for the judges of the salon, an impression is a prelude to a final work, which would be more like what Monet did in that first one. Uh, <clears throat> and so you would certainly not submit it to a salon. Now we have a small detour here because how did Monet get anywhere? Well, not everyone, it's not just his, youthful companions who were willing to explore that same territory with him. But there were some artists who were working within the system who were also interested in that much looser, freer brushwork that they, when, well, you just use the term expressive because it seems to express not only the way the artist moves his hand, um, which ought to be unique to each person's um, body, but also expressive of the sense of um, engagement of the artist how, and how a uh, sense of like a rapid intensity in it. And the artist who had made it in the, in the salon who most advocated for that was Eugene Delacroix. And this is our friend Fantin Latour in his, he did a series of paintings of these um, artists and writers and musicians and their just group portraits. And um, Delacroix had died in 1863, and this is just the year after that. So here's a, a portrait of Delacroix. Well, you, you know who this is, that's Manet. And you know this fellow, that's Baudelaire. And this is Whistler. A lot, most of these others are critics. But you see what Delacroix already in the 1830s. Um, and in fact, um, this kind of way of working is then associated with just becomes called romanticism here in this detail. Or you can also make out just patches, strokes. And when Delacroix was on, on the 
juries for the salon, he was ever trying to get these artists up and permitted in, but his, his voice was not enough. Corot also worked hard to get them recognition. This, Monet did get in the salon. This is a, just a, well, let me title, I guess, for this. It's, it's, well, no, it's just a road along the road to La Harvard at low tide. And it's a little bit big. Yeah, it's bigger. Three five feet by almost six feet. See, because he's working with the ambition of getting in the salon. And in the salon, you want to get some space. So you're working on a larger scale. So you have this wonderful lowering sky. Look at those oh, wind-filled clouds and then just the break there. And the water that's been roughened by it. And there's a fisherman and a man in his cart and these two horses. It looks as if it were one where Monet had set up his easel right here at the shoreline. However, in fact, he made sketches and he used these same groups in other paintings. And he did do this in the studio. But this um, is what he's about to do always out of doors. And where did he go to work out of doors more? Well, he had Boudin encouraging him to do that along the shore. And then he went to that forest of Fontainebleau, which is to the southeast of Paris, where the so-called Barbizon artists, of whom Corot was one, worked for part of the year going to sketch, make, compiling sketches, taking them back and creating paintings in their studios. Most of the time, Corot did do some very small ones just there. But uh, so Monet goes and meets a number of these Barbizon artists because they also are working out of doors. So they, that's just the whole way of thinking differently than in the confines of your studio. And this is one is called the Bodmer Oak. And it's in the map. And its size is, yeah, it's almost a little bit more than four feet across. So you see now for the leaves, the fallen leaves, these are just patches of orange. And he's so interested in the dappling of the light, and the backlighting. It's not just this tree, which was famous because an artist had done a, <clears throat> another Swiss artist had done a, a painting of this tree, which was in the salon the previous year. Monet is ambitious. He wants in that salon. He is going to try to get in that salon. So he has in mind, he's going to work on something big and make a name for himself because the one he did this was appreciated, but it didn't really draw much press. This man needs to sell. He needs money. He wants recognition. He wants something to nourish him. But what does he do when he wants to do something ambitious? He takes on Monet. Oh, that's a little detail I forgot to tell you. Got to have this. When this was, when this was in the salon, the label said this was by Manet. Oh, <laughs> Manet got so upset about that. <laughs> but that led to the two men meeting. And then ultimately, they're great friends. But uh, because Manet never, never did landscapes like this. Sarah Monet, too. So there's a story to this. This is the next and quite famous early work he did. And it's just now called the Dejeuner sur l'herbe, um, just as Monet's painting, which you're going to, uh, Monet's painting, which we'll look again at um, in a moment. But uh, this was uh, meant to be about, um, well, actually this one fragment is six and a half by about 10 feet, an enormous painting. Well, that's that aspiration for the salon right there. So these figures are life-size and over-life-size. Remember, 
Courbet had introduced that into the salon. And in the subject, just a few years earlier, there had been the scandal when uh, Manet's Dejeuner was shown in the Salon of Refused Works in 1863. So with the picnic of this very um, puzzling combination of figures, now you have a picnic. Although actually picnicking was a fairly common, well, it was a, a recurring theme among artists at this time because it's this celebration of the new leisure uh, of Parisians who could go out in the country. They could go to the forest of Fontainebleau and enjoy themselves. So when he did that Bodmer Oak, it was probably uh, preparatory to tackling this work. This is unfinished and peculiar because, uh, well, there should be more than this even. This enormous painting he was working on and for the 1866 Salon, sure he was gonna make a name for himself. He couldn't pay his rent. He had to stop working on it. And he gave this to his landlord as a surety. And the landlord took the canvas, rolled it up, it took a few years before Monet had enough money to be able to um, get it back. And parts of it had become moldy. So um, Monet cut it down. Now it's called Dejeuner sur l'herbe, it's kind of, it's sort of like in, in the no kind of pedestal. We don't know what Monet meant to call it. He never had to have a title for it because it was never displayed. And likewise, it's possible that Monet's version got its name, Dejeuner l'herbe, based on this one, because Monet had originally just called his the bath. So there's some kind of tension some um, back and forth between these two artists' visions of what they're doing. What would Monet's critique be here? I mentioned just, well, briefly when we're looking at this, how much this looked uh, really manifested that it was a work done in the studio, because those figures are just in no way integrated with this, which looks like a stage set. I mean, where's the light coming through the bushes? I mean, what even is the form back here? What, how do you get from here to there? This is like a painted stage set. Monet wanted to paint people truly in that of out of doors. The light shining through the trees, backlighting these two figures, dappling these white lawn dress, shining through in parts here. Uh, so it's a study of large figures. This is, um, he's not generally one who has an interest in figural painting. So he wants that for the being in the salon. <clears throat> Later, his, we think of him mainly as a landscape artist, but he wants to show all of the world surrounded by light and atmosphere. So you can feel what the temperature is. You can, in a sense, smell the air there that you can be in the three-dimensional actuality of that world. So there, as I said, there were other artists doing picnics as well. And there's possibly another thing that, that Monet had in mind. Maybe Monet did as well. Um, I think it's more Monet. Uh, he's thinking back to the Rococo period, to the early 18th century, and the very famous French artist Watteau, 
who did a lot of scenes called, they're called fête galants, so just the, the well-to-do enjoying themselves and picnicking out in the country. This one is in the Wallace Collection in, in London. So Monet may also want to claim his place in the long tradition of French art, not just vis-a-vis um, -vis his immediate predecessor. And we have some idea of what the full painting would have looked like from um, a colored an oil painting sketch he did of this. And this itself is four by six feet. You have a, you know, when you think of this size, okay, oh, that's a big painting. You stopped it. This is a sketch. The ambition of that and how rapidly he works that he can lay down the paint like this um, and then work on that, what he intended for the final painting all within the space of this one year. So, uh, see this figure over here is some servant. This, he's in the fragment, we don't. That's all where another part of the painting is missing over here. And I'll put the Pushkin one back on and you'll notice also this figure is different. So, so women in wonderful, elaborate costume, and these two in these sheer white gowns where you can see their flesh through. And when you see this tall fellow, tall fellow, tall fellow, he's had Basile pose for that. Because this is done in the studio. This is part of that sketch. He's very interested in the costumes. Let me get, well, no, I have to go. We'll do it with the later one. He's not so interested in the persons. Actually, it's um, the woman who will later become his wife. He's he models for several of these. And <laughs> Monet, still being a man of, of great poverty, could no more hire models who would have access to dresses as splendid as these. He probably took these from fashion magazines. So there's a lot of imagination involved in creating something that looks like it's in the true out of doors. It's just not as connected to earlier art as uh, Monet's is more obvious, more obviously so. And the Getty images are also very good color always. So you know this is a new, you just look at that, 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 that kind of orange is a, um, a chemical color. That's not a color in nature. So that's a part of the modernity here, just as these women's dresses are absolutely of that period in the 1860s. So this is the life of today. Now you see different looking fellow. Well, that's Courbet. Courbet had been to visit Monet and Brazil who were sharing a studio at that time and had made some um, fairly favorable contents, comments about this painting. So it seems like uh, Monet has honored him by then adding him to the scene. So he uses Camille, his future wife, for many of them, women. But he's not interested in facial 
or of the individual uh, features of the figures. But that light painted in us very quick, thick strokes, of course. See, so you see your arm through it. Light hitting it just back here. And reflected light from the cloth under her chin. When the arrangement of fruits is in the shadow, very little light, unlike Monet's. And just to show you how popular the theme was at that time, this is by um, Tissot, their, their good friend, um, who uh, Degas wanted to have in the Impressionist show, who did a picnicking scene several years later. And look how absolutely airless, spaceless, that is, although there's reflecting water and this should be light shining through here in shadow, but this has a reality that Tissot's, with all its realistic detail, does not. Well, since that, that painting was taken out of his hands, um, by his landlords um, to get something in the show um, in just, I think it was a couple of weeks, Monet produced this and it's about seven feet high. It's, it's a painting of Camille in a, in a um, green satin dress, also absolutely au courant, absolutely of the time. And this was accepted in the salon and this was enjoyed the comment always being about this dress, about the flow of this, this, um, Satin and the, the ripple in that. I mean, Zola wrote a lot about this, just how very fine it was. Monet made another attempt at doing large figures in an out of doors setting for the salon, and it's just called Women in the Garden. So, here in this, the size is. Uh, it's about nine feet high, this painting is. Camille, again, posed for most of the figures. Here's modernity. This is a illustrated fashion periodical of that time. And you see the clothing is, especially this one's very quite. Similar. And the theme of just women with their parasols out in the garden, out in nature. A theme of the moment. You'd get your, your, your magazine and there it was in the magazine. Or now he wants it, you go to the salon and you're gonna see it on the wall. He won't, he won't see it there. The Met had a show of Monet's paintings and costumes from the time, and you see how very close these are. So this is totally modern. And then there was a, there's a kind of interesting um, other modern aspect to this is that these are human figures, but there is no human story, nor do those women have much humanity. He, and in that, that's like another modern sense of how you're around people you don't know. They are here. These women are essentially fashion plates. They are celebrations of the fact that now um, there are factories that clothing can be mass produced um, that women can afford to have changeable fashion like this. So it's a celebration of the times. Yeah. 
How can he suggest Breeze? Well, not very well here. But with her, by making her move, you get the idea that something in here is movement. And then, of course, you get just a little flex of filtering light coming here. You know how he loves flowers. So the only light on her face is what's being reflected up from her skirt. This is all sheltered under her umbrella. We have just a couple of minutes uh, left at the time, but this one at the in the map. Uh, so this is 1867. Um, Monet and Camille have not yet married, but she she bears a child, and uh, Monet's father, in disapproval, cuts off all um, financial support to his son, and Monet has to um, move in with his aunt in a kind of wealthy suburb of Le Havre called uh, Saint Adresse, and this is at the terrace of her place. This is a radical painting. And let's just say what there is radical about this and we'll have to, well, I'll just tell you and we'll, we'll have to stop at that. So you're looking down on this as if you're in the house and looking down, maybe you're on the second floor and looking down at, which is a kind of an unusual uh, vantage point. This would be his father who knows who this is or who this couple is. You know that there's a, a breeze you can watch the smoke. You can watch and see the fluttering flags. So you can feel it on you. And you know there's a strong, clear sun because these are such distinctly edged shadows. So you have the breeze. You have the sun. You could smell being by the water. That is so vividly, physically, um, imaginatively possible. But could there be a place like this? Surely, yes, this is the, the, his, um, the locale where he was. But when you look at this painting, does this water look like that's in the distance? There's a band of land, a blend of blue water, a oops, a band of sky, oh my goodness, sky that flattens it out, as do those two flagpoles flatten it out into horizontals and verticals. So that is quite radical. And where might that come from? Uh, I'm not going to be able to show you. <clears throat> Probably his studying of, of Japanese prints. And um, if you take the next series, we will see more of that. But this is to invite you to go and uh, look at this in the mat. How it so balances something that's a two-dimensional made object where you can see each brushstroke and dab of color by the artist making it with a scene that's in the out of doors. And that's uh, where we have to stop for today. Certainly, if there are questions. Yes, I have questions one. or anything you want me to go back to, either one. I have one. Yes. Um, the, the Monet uh, by the sea with the clouds. Uh, that early one? It was dark? Yeah, the, very dark, yes. Oop. This one. That one? Yes, yes. What is yeah. the name of that? I didn't catch that. Well, that's because I didn't give it to you because I'm so terrible at pronouncing French. <laughs> I can spell it for you better than that. Is the Pointe de la Heve, H-E-V-E, -E, at low tide. 
Okay, yeah, I want to look it up because I found myself really responding strongly yes. to it. Because and doesn't it just have that cold, glistening, water receding? Yeah. yeah. It reminds me of like Hudson River and uh, light painters and things, yes. the kind of mood. Yes, yes. But I also wanted to say um, this whole series has been so amazing. Please continue. Oh, well, I'm Please going do to. more. You, you can't stop me. So May 18th is the first one. Yay. All right. That's a Thursday. So much. Thursdays at three. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to look at another one? No? Okay. Thanks, Maggie. Sure. I will stop sharing then. Oh, I don't like to stop looking at them myself, but. They were all so wonderful. We could see them again and again. Yes. Yeah. You know, it isn't, I mean, oh, the, the, I had trouble finding some images for you because you should try this. Take something like the magpie. Google that. You're going to find at least two dozen, three dozen sites where it's for sale. Reproduction, handmade reproduction, reproduction, poster, reproduction. These are so popular now that it's hard to imagine that the public was like, yeah, when they saw them first. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Goodbye. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And we'll see thank you then next time. Yes. Yeah, you sure will. Next.